Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're going to do a little live Q&A session. We are going to dive in deep here. One of the first things we're going to talk about is fructose metabolism. I've heard people say it's 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 fructose, it's fructose. I doctor uh, pediatric endocrinologist out of UC San Francisco, Dr. Ro Robert Lustig. He in the conversation we had, it's pronounced fructose, not fructose. Just for the for all you people out there on the on the grammar police side. All right, so fructose is an important sugar. This is going to be a sugar found primarily in fruit. Now, we do have high fructose corn syrup, which is a 55-45 mix, 55 fructose, I think 45 glucose. All right, and your typical table sugar is sucrose, which is, I think, 50-50 uh, fructose and glucose. Mm -hmm. So when you have high fructose corn syrup, number one, there's no nutrients attached to it, number one. Number two, it's unbound to fiber, number two. And then number three is there is some data that in the in the refining process with the corn, right? A lot, it's typically gonna be derived from corn, high fructose corn syrup. So number one, with the corn, there's potentially a gluten sensitivity issue there. Some of these proteins may get distilled into the high fructose corn syrup. That may be controversial and debatable. Number two is gonna be the Roundup or the glyphosate residue that you may get in the high fructose corn syrup, right? So most corn, 90, 95% of corn is gonna be GMO and it's gonna be Roundup ready. So they use Roundup is a means to spray it on planes so you don't have to be discriminate in how you use pesticides. So you're going to have that potential Roundup or glyphosate residue, which could provide another bit of inflammation. So why is high fructose corn syrup different than the fructose in your fruit? So number one, nutrition's not there. Number two, not bound to fiber. Fiber tends to time release a lot of the breakdown of the sugar into your body. Okay, number three are going to be potential toxic residues through pesticides, glyphosate, and there's some data to show in the processing of fructose, there is potentially some mercury involved. You can Google uh, high fructose refinement and mercury residue. There's some data showing that. So those are my big concerns about anything that has high fructose corn syrup in it. Now with fruit, typically you're going to have a lot more undigestible fiber in there that's going to slow things down. So a handful of berries, for instance, may have, you know, five or six grams of fructose in it with the fiber and all the nutrition. And if it's organic, then we kind of sidestep a lot of the glyphosate and Roundup residue, which is a plus. Now, if we look at how glucose is metabolized versus fructose, there's, there's a drastic difference. Fructose is primarily metabolized in the liver. So in the liver, you have about 60 or 70 grams of stored fructose available. Now, if you're eating a handful of berries, you got like maybe eight grams there, not a big deal, right? Because you got to eat a whole bunch of berries in one sitting to really tap out um, your liver glycogen stores, number one. Once your liver glycogen stores are tapped out, your, mu your muscles are going to be primarily used next. Now, the difference is fructose primarily goes to the liver. So you, you have about three or 400 grams of reservoir in your muscles. If you lift and you do resistance training, maybe more. Because when you lift, you're depleting the glycogen, right? That glycogen is stored carbohydrate. But number two, you're hypertrophying your muscles. Therefore, you're making the reservoir, that sponge, bigger. And then number three is you increase these little receptors on the outside of the muscle called GLUT4, which pulls more of it in and keeps it out of your bloodstream, which is great. So that means you need less insulin to bring those fructose levels down, which is really good. So recap, once that liver starts to become saturated with glycogen, glycogen is just stored glucose right? And fructose is going to be primarily the type of sugar that goes to the liver. So fructose can also be stored as glycogen as well. Once that is fully stored and your muscles are fully stored, what will happen is you'll start to have more insulin resistance happen. You'll start to have more insulin resistance, even though fructose a lot of times doesn't jack up your blood sugar. It can create systemic insulin resistance once your liver is fully saturated. And then that over time will increase your insulin levels. And then insulin is associated with lots of other conditions. Type, or, type in hyperinsulinism and many, many other conditions. We want your fasting insulin ideally below seven and a perfect world below five. So these are some good markers that you can use to look at. You can also look at your fructosamine, which kind of gives you a 10-day window and how your fructose levels are at. So keep that kind of in the back of your head as, 
is, is what's happening physiologically. And this is part of the reason why glucose tends to be a little bit better if we're doing carbohydrate sources because you have a bigger reservoir for glucose in your muscles. And if you're using your muscles, you can constantly wring out that sponge. That sponge is your muscle what's holding glucose. You can wring it out and then that becomes more absorptive for your next meal or the next day, etc. So that's why resistance training and exercise provides a huge benefit with, um, provides a huge benefit in, in regards to helping with insulin resistance. And this is part of the reason why doing interval based training, using those type two muscle fibers, the, the bigger, the fast twitch muscle fibers tends to wring out that sponge better and it provides more stimulation for those muscles to grow and also soaks up a lot of glucose. You're going to be burning a lot more glucose and carbohydrate during the high intensity movement. So kind of recapping, fructose prefers the liver, glucose prefers the muscle. Um, once that liver is saturated with fructose, which gets converted to liver glycogen, that starts to create a systemic insulin resistance cascade, and that creates more problems. And then you have an upregulation of inflammatory JNK1 enzymes in the liver, which part of this non-alcoholic steatotic hepatitis, that's inflamed liver, not because of alcohol, but because of actual carbohydrate. All right, hope that helps everyone. Let's dive in here to a live Q&A. Let me know what you guys think. Let's dive in. Um, Dennis writes in, what are some natural inhibitors of COMT methyl transferase? I'm not sure about that. I really, I'd, I'd have to do a little bit more research on that. I know there's a lot of genetic predispositions to that, and that typically has a, um, a major effect on tyrosine and dopamine and some of your stress neurotransmitter metabolism. I'll do a little bit more research on that. Lifehouse writes in, what's your take on the carnivore diet? I've done some really good videos on this topic and interviews. Look at my interview with, uh, with uh, Caitlin Weeks. We did a good conversation on it. For some people, it can be excellent. Um, you can Google uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson's daughter, Mackenzie, or M Michaela Peterson. She has an extreme autoimmune condition that would attack her joints. And even some of the regular non-starchy healthy vegetables provided enough, let's just say, anti-nutrients in that compound to essentially inflame her joints. So that could be part of what's happening here is some people are incredibly autoimmune sensitive and even those anti-nutrients in the plants could be enough to set that whole cascade off. So if you Google her, she has an interesting story regarding her diet, going keto and going carnivore. Now, not everyone may have to go to that extreme and there's some really good nutrients in plants. I mean, for instance, potassium is a great one. It's hard to get that, but if you're doing extra bone broth and sea salt and you're doing um, maybe some celery juice where the fiber is gone, or if we're just doing organ meats, you may be able to fill in the gaps. Organ meats, bone broth, maybe an electrolyte supplement just to make sure those extra minerals are there could be helpful. Oliver writes in, when I eat spinach and chard, my teeth feel chalky. What does this mean? Should I avoid these foods? Hard to say. It could be a mineral in the food. It could be, I'm not sure if you washed it appropriately. Hard to say. Lamb writes in Dr. J, um, in the multi-pack, I cannot differentiate between the two white capsules. What's the white long one versus the white thicker, shorter one? Shorter one is magnesium and longer one is calcium. And that's just based off of the fact that the calcium has a higher amount in the capsule. Therefore, I'm, I'm surmising the bigger capsule is the one with the larger amount. Dennis Rice in, is it true that caffeine is a carcinogen? I heard from a scholar with a PhD in zo zoology. I mean, I've heard that ca caffeine is a natural insecticide that is used by plants to prevent themselves from being eaten. Now, the question becomes when you typically consume caffeine, you're never consuming it in isolation, right? This is, this is the big deal. So when you consume caffeine, there's a lot of other alkaloids and powerful antioxidants that come with it. And the question is, are those beneficial antioxidants negating any of the carcinogenic effects? That's the big thing. Like some people talk about the fact that, hey, you develop heterocyclic amines when you cook your meat or there's any charring of your meat. But many people have said, well, yeah, but if you're eating that meat with some organic broccoli or a nice salad, any of the antioxidants you get in the plant-based nutrients will combat that you know, tenfold, meaning it makes the meat and the carcinogens in the meat, let's say a moot point, so to speak. So you have to look at everything in combination. Never, nothing's ever in isolation. It's usually a combination of other things that happen with it. So that's the, that'd be my argument on that. <clears throat> How much fruit is allowed during taking antimicrobials currently only eating granny Smith and kiwis. So I would typically add in more fruit and or more starch, especially FODMAP starches. That could be squash. I mean, that could be sweet potatoes. Um, that could be other types of starches that are going to be uh, moderate to higher. There's a great app for your smartphone called low FODMAP A to Z. You can use that as a good idea to get more options, but 
increasing it just enough where you create a little bit of bloating uh, may be okay because it acts like cheese on a mousetrap to bait any of these critters out. Uh, what could cause back pain in men specifically after waking up in the morning? Uh, hard to say. I mean, the biggest thing I would look at if it's in the morning and you don't have it during the day when you're when you're up and about, I would look at your mattress. I personally have a, a nice Tempur-Pedic mattress. Um, I love it. Really good. So I would look at the mattress first thing. Mo writes in Dr. J, is it possible for someone to have hypoglycemic symptoms like muscle weakness and lightheadedness, even if the blood sugar readings are coming out normal? It's possible because you your blood sugar may look normal because it's being lifted up by adrenaline and cortisol. So you have to look at that as a potential driving factor. It's like if I am standing up right now. Am I really standing up because I'm strong? Or maybe I'm being propped up and I have a whole bunch of back braces on keeping me up, right? The question is, is it up naturally because it because everything is in homeostasis? Or am I being propped up artificially, right? So that's really the question when it comes to your blood sugar too. Christian White's in, I lost so much weight after the candida diet and look skinny and sick. How much, how can I gain weight? Um, I eat now, but can't gain weight and very afraid of candida might come back. So number one is when you're doing a candida killing program, you should start to be adding in some of the moderate to higher carbohydrate foods back in, you know, at least moderately. I tell patients, don't do it so much where you cause bloating and gas, but do enough to put cheese on the mousetrap to bait things out. And you have to figure out what your macronutrient ratios are for you, Christian. So if you feel better at a carbohydrate percentage of 20 or 30%, then we may want to taper those carbs back to that point and make sure you're getting enough calories. If your calories are too low, you will lose weight. That's just a natural fact, but we have to look at your macros and where you feel the best. We have to make sure the macros are different or at least the quality of the macros aren't what you were eating before all this, right? And a lot of people have candida, not because it's candida, but it's candida and other parasites and other infections. So you have to make sure any co-infections along with that candida are also addressed. If not, it's like pulling weeds out at the surface of the of the, the soil versus pulling it out of the root. Robert writes saying, Dr. J, um, can athletes' foot symptoms be something else than candida, e.g. leaky gut, all candida tests, stool blood were negative. Um, well, athlete's foot, by definition, is going to be candida. I mean, there's, there's tinea cura, tinea capitis, tinea is fungus-based. Again, if you're looking at fungus on your outside externally, Sometimes that will not come up in a stool or blood test because it's external. And a lot of times the immune system can't attack it. That's why a lot of rashes on the skin or fungal toes need some kind of a topical treatment because the body, it's, it's really hard for the immune system to go and attack it because it has to really push things out very far. And you may need some topical support to work it out. Now, candida could drive leaky gut right? So is leaky gut a cause or effect? I want to make sure there's no other issues besides candida going on. And you'd want to topically work on uh, hitting it. Um, I've talked about dealing with athlete's foot before. Check out previous podcasts on that. I do a combination of a soak, a soak, uh, an herbal soak that I use called the herbal, uh, herbal foot fungal soap. You can get that at justinhealth.com slash shop. And then typically I'll do something topical as well to hit it topically. So a soak as well as something topical. What are some common die-off reactions when H. pylori dies? I mean, it could be anything from mood to nausea to depression to diarrhea to fatigue. All of those are potential. All right. Neon Area writes in Dr. J. Good morning. I was wondering if you get if you're getting swollen, puffy feet caused by histamine potentially. Thanks, dude. Um Swollen puppy feet caused by histamine. It's possible. I mean, I'd want to look at other issues too, other other inflammatory foods. And then number two, I'd want to look at um, thyroid too. Thyroid's a big cause when you see swollen feet. It could be thyroid too. Dr. J, I want to let you know I used your affiliate link to order mold testing from your immunolytics. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you very much, Heidi. I appreciate it. El Guerrero writes in, are these recorded and posted on your channel? I missed the answer to my question. Yep, they are posted on the channel. So feel free and go back and take a look at it. K Gupta writes in, which supplement should I avoid if I want to get a GI map test on HCL enzymes or oregano? I would just be on the HCL and the enzymes. That's fine. And, and stay away from the oil of oregano. I would say at least for a week or so or two weeks before you get the test done. Mo writes in, I get hypoglycemia symptoms when I don't wear enough clothes in a cold air environment like an air-conditioned room, do you know uh, that could be possible? I mean, it depends. It depends on how cold because environmental stress could be, it does put stress on your adrenals. So you're, it's possible your adrenals could make more adrenaline 
um, to kind of rev up your metabolism, so to speak, because the environment's creating a stress response. So it's definitely possible. Can quite a little silver cause diarrhea? Yep, it definitely could be a die off, just killing things off in your body needing to flush it out. You're welcome, Neon. Uh, the Corvac writes in, is wheat pasta good or is that a better option for pasta? I mean, I typically stay away from grain and wheat. Lots of data on non-celiac gluten sensitivity showing that gluten can increase gut permeability. So that tends to be a major mechanism for autoimmunity. So my kind of mindset is, well, let's find other options that are less inflammatory. So you can do zucchini noodles, you can do sea potato noodles, or you can even do mir uh, miracle noodles, which are like a shirataki kind of um, cognac Japanese yam that's relatively very low carb too. And then you can mix that with some healthy meat sauce or maybe a coconut cream based sauce. And then you got a really good combo. What should I be taking? What should we take? What should we take while taking DE charcoal? Anything else? It depends. I mean, um, if you're doing charcoal, you may not have a need for DE. I'll use DE with worms a lot of times. Sometimes I'll just do charcoal by itself. So it depends. So you could do it by itself is totally fine in between meals though. Tammy writes in, good morning, Dr. J. I've been taking 150 milligrams Thorn Fair Absorb for six months and my iron and ferritin levels are not budging. What are some reasons I'm not absorbing? So the first thing is I wanna make sure your gut is dialed in, Tammy. Make sure there's no infections. Make sure your food's looking good. Make sure you have enough HCL and enzymes dialed in. And then number three, uh, make sure you're eating actual, you know, healthy animal sources of, of heme-based iron like uh, grass-fed meat or liver. And I would say number four would be make sure there's no estrogen dominance. So if you have excessive periods and you're bleeding more than, you know, four or so tampons for two or three days during your cycle, you could be losing a lot of your iron just via having estrogen dominance and excessive menstruation. It's very possible that could be part of what's happening. Let me jump over to Facebook real quick, guys. Michael writes in, what would cause a person to not process and digest carbs? Well, I mean, if you have fructose uh, malabsorption, and that's common with SIBO, you may have a lot of you know difficulty processing fructose because the bacteria in your gut's feeding off it, and that's kind of spitting off a whole bunch of gases like methane and hydrogen, which could disrupt your digestion and cause a lot of bloat and cause you to feel off. Is oatmeal a good option for bulking? I mean, it's a carbohydrate, so carbs tend to be really good bulking agents. The question is the avenin in the oatmeal um, could be inflammatory, especially if you're not getting a bop. So you need to make sure it's lab tested oatmeal. I typically always recommend safe starches just in case there's gluten sensitivity with cross reactive grains. So I always tend to recommend starchy tubers over grains just to be safe. There's not like this one missing nutrient that's in oatmeal that you can't get in other starches. So from a nutrient perspective, there I don't think there's a, a valid argument where that has to be the only thing consumed. So I recommend leaning more on the starchy side, the safe starchy tuber side. Mo writes in, do you know of any supplements that could be good for keeping blood sugar in check for hypoglycemia? Well, number one, making sure if you're having low blood sugar, making sure you're not going longer than four or five hours without eating, making sure you have 30 grams of protein first thing in the morning, and you're eating a combination of good healthy protein and fats with each meal, and you're not doing too much carbs because too much carbs can create a reactive hypoglycemic drop, which can also further exacerbate low blood sugar. Carlos writes in, hey Carlos, is pea protein okay with the gut? Yeah, pea protein tends to be a little bit more hypoallergenic, so I like it. Also, collagen peptides tend to be good, as well as just free form amino acids. The pea tends to be pretty good uh, on the hypo on the uh, hypoallergenic side. All right, I hope I answered most of the questions here, guys. Sue writes in, do you find that people with pernicious anemia also have H. pylori? So yeah, this kind of goes back to the other question there. Pernicious anemia is basically antibodies to either parietal cells or um, intrinsic factor in the stomach. That's the binding factor that binds, H, uh, that binds B12 and then it's reabsorbed at the end of the small intestine in the ileum. So it's very possible that H. pylori could drive that. So doing sublingual um, B12 can kind of help bypass some of that to maximize the absorption while you fix um, the H. pylori. So definitely possible, Susie. Is it related to gluten sensitivity? Yes, definitely is related to gluten sensitivity. Trisha writes in, my TSH is 0.02, T4 free is 1.4, T3 free is 3.2. Doctor says I'm fast, but any ideas why I feel slow, cold, hair falling out, can't lose weight taking Synthroid? So the TSH looks a little bit low for me. Your T4 at, I think you're saying 1.4. 
I think you mean 1.4. That, that's pretty good. And T3 at 3.2 is pretty good. Again, if that's right after taking your, your thyroid support, it may be a little bit low because when you take your thyroid support and then two to three hours later you test, it, it could be the highest it ever is, but it's sitting on average maybe in the mid twos. So I'd want to see where you're sitting at fasting as well. But more than likely, get, get you to the upper threes will be a, a better goal. But if you're still having issues, I would look deeper at the adrenals and deeper at the gut. Sam writes in, my father, 58 years old, has high ferritin levels, 621. After a therapeutic phlebotomy, we brought it down to 500. His RBG got too low, 3.9 for anemic range. What to do to further lower it? So it's possible the ferritin could be up higher because of inflammation. So I'd want to know where his iron saturation is, his TIBC is, and also look at his inflammatory markers like CRP. Um, but I'd go easy on the uh, therapeutic phlebotomy. Um, I would probably just do it once a quarter, once a quarter. Because his, his, probably his red blood cells will go back up within a few weeks. There, there could be an acute response afterwards. I mean, that's why you see people a couple days after giving blood, they're kind of a little bit tired. So more than likely a few weeks to a month later, he should be fine and maybe ready to do another therapeutic phlebotomy. All right, guys, uh, Bob Rysen, Dr. J, if back pain is not due to mattress, what else could it be? Very often I get pain over kidney area when I wake. Usually it's released when I go to the bathroom. Um, yeah, it could be just the fact that there's pressure in your intestines and that's creating a viscerosomatic reflux to the back area and releasing it. If having that number two bowel movement makes it better, then that's probably what it is. Again, the kidneys are right in that T12 L1 area. So you'd want to make sure there's not fixations or any, any structural issues that could be at play. But if going to the bathroom makes it better, it's very possible that just you're having that nerve um, sensation is creating a viscerosomatic reflex. Why does Evan include the GP mycotox test as his standard test for all patients, but you don't? Um, the reason why is because Evan's had a personal experience with mold being a major driving factor of his issue. So we've had this conversation. So because he's had that experience, he's projecting that onto everyone else. Um, I don't do that because I didn't have that experience. So I'm a little bit more selective in who I recommend it to. Evan isn't as much because of his personal experience. So I understand that. We've had this conversation. I'm a little bit more prudent in who I give it to, meaning I look for out of this world, let's say neurological issues, or I inquire about, um, let's say moldy house issues, or hey, how do you feel when you're leaving the house for a period of time? So I'm a little bit more prudent in who I recommend it to, but I still do it frequently. I still do it frequently and I've done it on myself as well. So I'm just a little bit more, not a catch all for everyone, but a little bit more discriminant in who I recommend it to. But I think it, it's a big driving factor. And yeah, so that's my take on it. Jimmy Young writes in, swollen prostate, I think urinating frequent, especially in the morning, sometimes at night. Okay, yep. Yeah. What's the question there? So you want to work on getting that inflammation down. So first thing is start with the diet. Almost all thyroid is gluten. Depends. I mean, if you're doing Synthroid, there's some um, corn starch in there. So potentially it'd be that for sure. Carlos writes in, is it okay to take mega IgG with the GI restore or an empty stomach in the morning or take with food? No, empty stomach's fine. I have no problem with that. The mega ITG, I think, has instructions. You could do it with food. So that's fine as well, but empty stomach is fine. Vivek writes in, when do you recommend GABA supplementation to a patient? It depends. Patients that have a lot of anxiety and have a really difficulty time, difficult time turning off and things like blood sugar and other calming nutrients are not enough, then we'll look at theanine and GABA. The Tom writes in, for someone with GI issues, is gluten-free oatmeal still inflammatory? What about quinoa? Um, if you have GI issues, I would cut that out because it could be a variable. You just don't want low hanging fruit to have a higher probability of being a variable in there. Um, what's your opinion on GAPS diet? The Healy Gut GAPS is great. I think it's really good. GAPS still has a lot of FODMAPs in it. So there potentially, if there's a lot of bloat or gas still, we may need to look at doing an autoimmune. I kind of combine autoimmune GAPS and FODMAP stuff with patients. So I kind of use a hybrid. I, I look at tools indiscriminately. I don't have a dog in the fight. And then I just try to do my best to make hybrids based off of the recommendations. How often should I supplement magnesium? Every day is fine. Um, if you're getting you know seven or eight servings of green vegetables and good healthy meats, you may not need it. But I think magnesium is one of those um, minerals where it's good to add because it has over a thousand enzymatic roles in the body. So I have no uh, problem with that. 
Uh, what type of diet is good for swollen prostate? So pumpkin seeds, great. Lycopene's great. Selenium's great. Saw palmetto is great. These are all nat natural 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Uh, zinc is great. So these are really good co compounds um, that can be really helpful at reducing inflammation. I have a product that I recommend. Um, email my office and we can get it for you. It's a specific prostate product that we special order that has a lot of those in it. Um... Yes, Laura, I agree. Almost all thyroid issues are associated with gluten. I totally agree. Yep. Uh, who's your recommended therapist? Oh, I use a gentleman. Daniel Hill is great. Uh, DanielHill.biz, I think, is his website. You can Google him. If you reach out to him, tell him I referred you over. He's really good. He does a lot of, let's just say, um, subconscious type of techniques to dip into the subconscious mindset versus just talk therapy. So like EFT, NLP, EMDR, these are really good therapies to deal with subconscious trauma and also to help us sabotage too, self-sabotage. Christine writes in, any good suggestions for using enzymes, amino acids when digestion is impaired, brands, possible SIBO, but sometimes notice gurgling in the intestine. So there's a lot of good brands out there. I mean, I'll recommend mine because it's, this is my, my live video here. So justinhealth.com slash shop. I have a HCL Supreme and an enzyme synergy that work great. You know, I just try to choose the best raw material when I formulate my products. A lot of other good brands too. Typically, we'll work HCL up to calibration till either we hit warmness or, you know, typically I don't go more than three or four grams um, just because I'm concerned about ulcers. And then we back off. And then enzymes, one to three caps, tends to be helpful chewing your foods up and avoiding raw foods if you're having a lot of digestive issues. All right, guys, I got to jump on to my next patient here. It's been real. I'll be back on Monday. We'll do another live QA and we'll dive in deeper. We'll do a podcast on Monday too. Hope everyone has a phenomenal weekend and enjoyed your 4th of July. I sure did. I cooked some ribs yesterday. It came back, came out phenomenal. Really good. I have some leftovers uh, today as well. So excited for that. All right, you guys have a phenomenal weekend and we'll be in touch. Comments below, future topics, thumbs up, likes, hit the share button. Appreciate it, y'all. Take care. Bye.